The Devlin Doyle Podcast, Simon Doyle, man of leisure, pleasure, a national treasure, whipping all around the world, calling cricket every part of the globe. That's his job. My name is Martin Devlin. I work for The Platform. We're talking cricket today, the T20 Women's World Cup and the White Ferns, skulking home, tail between the legs. Is this what we deserve? Is it simply a case of poor performance equals this is what happens? You get dumped out of the tournament. No excuse that the table doesn't lie. The results very clearly say we aren't good enough right now. Let's also talk test cricket. Australia versus India. A capitulation again from the Australian batting lineup. I mean, <laughs> what have they got? The yips. Why can't they bat in India? And the second test at the Basin. England versus New Zealand. Let's not call it the B-ball. Let's just call it an English cricket team that is playing with immense confidence and that being expressed by every single one of their players who seems to just get a bat in hand and go absolutely berserk. How does the second test unfold? All of that to talk about. Dooley, where are you driving, mate? Uh, I'm on my way to Lahore from Multan. So the first uh, week and a bit of the PSL uh, all done up in Multan and now we're down to Lahore for... Uh, the second sort of second leg of it, but um, I'm going to nip back uh, home to Dubai for uh, for three days, get a couple of days' work done there, and then come back to uh, to Lahore. So I'm just heading heading into Lahore for uh, uh, a couple of hours, and then to the airport. Okay, so look, uh, you know, I messaged you before, and I said, you know, what what are the roads? I mean, and, and you know, you know, forgive me for saying this, but you know, it's a motorway, but. You know, Smithy's always told me about when you're on the subcontinent, it might be a motorway, but there's a guy with a horse and cart, there's a cow wandering over there, there's a person selling. <laughs> is it like that or not? No, not quite. Not quite here. This is a very, I mean, it's a very good motorway, to be honest with you. Three lanes all the way. Um, it, we've done, uh, what did we have? 370 kilometre drive, Marty. And I'm. Uh, we left at uh, 9... Just after 9pm local time, it's now 12.30, so it's taken three and a half hours, we're about 20 minutes away. Oh, that's brilliant, so, mate. Not that's bad brilliant. for a 370-kilometre drive, when you think about that. Yeah, that's. Uh, I mean, look, that's better that's than our roads, mate. It's pretty good. Yeah, and that's actually better than that's driving from Auckland. Way better, way better yeah. than our roads. Oh, sh- okay. Um, before yeah, we get on... And, and better, better drivers, too, just quietly. More, more kind of courteous, are they? <laughs> yes, yes, Absolutely. <laughs> All right, before we get on to the cricket, I want to, you know, if you've been following this Ian Foster thing, it's just extraordinary, the incompetence of the administration of our national sport. And and it just doesn't seem to improve or get better or go in a different direction ever. How has it got to this point where uh, the administrators, I mean, and we're we're not only talking rugby. I mean, we've been quite critical at times of, of the administration at the top of New Zealand cricket as well. And, I mean, we seem to have been, um, or seem to be going right down the same street. Weird, eh? You know, and sorry, my man's my man's just got his uh, my man's just got his GPS going as well. <laughs> um, but yeah, look, I just can't quite get over it, Marty. It's um, it, you know, they're making some very strange decisions. Uh, they're putting, I guess they're putting Foster. Uh, he feels like they're putting him under pressure. Um, I, I don't know what the outcome will be. What do they want to? They want to lock Robertson in, or they want to lock, they want to lock a new coach in before they take off to the World Cup this year. Is that fair on on the current coach? Uh, it all seems a bit of a shambles, isn't it? That's a total shambles, mate. And look, my personal view is no, I don't think it's fair, and I don't think it's fair in any employment situation where you know they tell you, okay, well you've got this job till then, and we want you to overachieve and do this, but you know that the guy behind you's got a knife ready to stab you in the back, and they've got somebody else actually. It's just really unsettling, mate. How can that possibly be the best possible preparation for our team to go to the World Cup? It can't be. I would, I would almost. I mean, look, I know you. It'd be a very difficult thing to do, but. I would say, look, if you want this bloke, have him now. I'll walk away, and, and good luck at World Cup. Is, I mean, why bother going? I guess the only reason you, you, you think about going is if you think you can win it and, and stick it right up them and, and get yourself a decent contract overseas again and, and take off. But uh, it, it's a terrible employment situation for all concerned, I would imagine. I agree. Absolutely agree, mate. All right, let's talk some cricket. Before we get on to the boys' stuff, the T20 women, the White Ferns, come back with the tail between the legs. Um, in the end, they you know it was out of their hands. South Africa didn't lose a wicket chasing down Bangladesh, about 130, I think it was, something like that. Is it just a case, and we've talked about this for the last couple of weeks, mate, that the table doesn't lie, the results don't lie, those are the runs you got, those are the wickets you lost, where you finished is where you deserve to finish? 100%. Look, I mean, you know that I've been about this for quite some time. 
this hopefully is the straw that breaks the camel's back and we finally get a real overhaul of the women's game in New Zealand. We finally get some, uh, we finally get the coaching structure right. We finally get the structure right where the girls obviously play in a decent competition in New Zealand. We have to make sure that that is a, a competition that is worthy of them playing in. We do not let them go overseas and earn money like we, the same. I mean, they're on contract. They want the same amount of money as, as the men's team, so they pass the same fitness standards. Uh, they pass. The, they do have the same standards in front of them as far as not being allowed to go overseas when there's a New Zealand tournament on or a local domestic tournament on, and uh, we make we hold them accountable. Um, you know, and, and and that has to happen. They want, you know, uh, they want all everything fair and just and equality until such time as they don't want equality, and, and, and that's the argument I have. So it needs a complete overhaul, and you know, until that happens, um, I don't think we're going to move forward. You know, it's 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 easy to you know to 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 be glib about this kind of stuff. But when we get told that oh the domestic competitions aren't good enough, you know my my initial reaction is well how about this for an idea? You go and practice, and then you go and practice, and then you go and train harder, practice more, get better, and then you go and practice again. Rather than blame everyone else, why don't you actually get better? Is that is that what what am I an an absolute idiot by actually saying that? Because to me, the personal responsibility is if you don't no. believe that you're actually getting what you need, get out there and do what David Beckham did and kick the ball twenty thousand times till you get it right. Yeah, absolutely. And, and just, um, you know, accept the fact that you are making exactly the same mistake as you have made at every World Cup for the last eight years. And, and some of these, couple of these senior players have made exactly the same mistakes against the same top teams. Now, I, I think I've talked about this before on the show, but if you look at our so-called two absolute gun players, you know, two players who, who everybody raves on about time and time again, their numbers at World Cups against India, Australia, and England are atrocious, averaging eight and ten in, in, in all World Cups against the three top sides that we play against. They beat up on the little on the little nations and on the lesser teams and underperform against the bigger teams time and time again. And why do we keep putting up with it? Uh, that, that's what I sort of I don't understand. They have not changed the game one bit. They've been poorly coached for a long, long time. And they've been allowed to run the run the team and run the cutter and get rid of coaches whenever they wanted to get rid of coaches, and and, and time has come to have a complete overhaul and a complete look into that uh, that side of the game in New Zealand. Well, I tell you what, if you just join this conversation, people, Dolly could be talking about the football ferns because there's your parallel. It's exactly the same, mate, where a group of senior players wield so much power and a lot of these women are they're there to feather their own nest, to get a glorious exit at a Women's World Cup in New Zealand. And they're actually, I mean, to me, they're actually squatting on a place in the team. And, you know, it's, but hey, you know, you and me can talk about this, but the administrations in charge are afraid of doing anything for fear of a backlash or being called sexist or misogynist. This is the reality of professional sport, people. It's like broadcasting, Simon. You've been in a long time. You've had your disappointments. You've had jobs taken off you. You've been stabbed in the back. All the same things that I've had. But if you want to actually play in this environment, and for all the rewards and the privileges we get for it, that's the shitty side of it. And you've got to get used to that. And if you don't get used oh, to that, we'll absolutely. go get a real job. Yeah. Absolutely. And, and look, I, you know, and I'll tell you often, Marty, and I'll tell everyone every time I, I sort of talk to anyone about and about playing the game, the game owes me absolutely nothing. Did I feel hard done by at times? Absolutely. Of course I did. But it owes me completely. Everything I do now is a consequence of Pull in a jersey on a few times for my country, and I'm a very, you know, very privileged to, to be able to have done that and do what I do now. But uh, you know, but there, was, was there hard times? Absolutely. Were there times? Well, gee, you know, I deserve it more than he does. Why am I? But but that is that is part and parcel of it. And did I get criticised in the media? Absolutely. Yes. Oh, who heaps but it on you, mate? How it is? If you want, you know, if, exactly. But if you want the accolades that come with these things, you also have to take the criticism and accept that it is. A job, and and you have to front up and do your job. If you're not doing your job, if you're just there collecting a check, and you know the other thing I say, professionalism and not, is not a paycheck. It's an attitude. It, it, it's it's a, you know it's hard work. You know the only only what well, they say the only place that that that, that um payment the perf, payment comes before work or something like that is in the dictionary. You know it's sort of one of those situations. You, you've got to front up.
Simon Dawes with us. All right, on to the two tests then. Uh, and the Basin Reserve, um, obviously not a pink ball test. Sell out for the first three days, which is fantastic news for the Black Caps, for England, for New Zealand cricket as a whole, that people are loving test cricket. And I think this, this England side obviously mm. brings a huge crowd on its own. All right, mate. How do we approach this test? Because first and foremost, you've got to put that one in Tauranga behind you, don't you? Yeah, you do. It, it's um, We know now. I mean, it's not a surprise how England play. It is not a surprise. I don't know that we selected the right sort of team. I know it was difficult when, when Jameson got injured and Henry was unavailable. You're looking for that next the next one and two players that, that are that are going to get an opportunity. Now, I don't think Tickner or Kugelheim did a bad job, in, in all honesty. We just probably lacked a few runs, and we lacked a little bit of discipline with the ball when we needed it. England will give you opportunities, and they will continue to give you opportunities when they're batting. But if you continue to feed those boundary balls, but you'll just get hurt, and they will run away with the game, and they'll score at five and a half, six, six and a half and over. So... It, is, it comes down to discipline with the ball and bowling one side of the wicket, setting fields accordingly and, and being able to do that for long periods of time. Because if you do do that, opportunities will come. So New Zealand, I'm sure, you know, they, they do know that. I'm, I'm sure the bowling group and, and, and Tim Southey in particular, along with bowling coaches, have talked about that and have talked about it and talked about it probably over the last three or four days. But they now have to deliver on that. Simon Doyle is with us on the platform. Doyle, uh, Devlin Doyle podcast, the DDP. Look, we got 19 wickets in Tauranga, mate. We got nine, okay? So let's just remember that. It wasn't like we couldn't bowl yeah. them out. You know, it's just, it was just the rate that no. they were scoring it. I can also let you know, look, the weather forecast for, 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 for tomorrow, Saturday and Sunday, um, 70% rain, 80% rain, um, 30% on Sunday. It doesn't say it's going to rain all day, but the reason I'm bringing this up is it's pretty damn hot down there at the moment, and that should actually provide some really good swing conditions as well, which means that Broad and, and Anderson are going to be pretty unplayable, but you've played when the ball swings down there, mate, and it actually makes for a hell of a spectacle. Yeah, absolutely. That's the great conditions for swing bowling. The problem is they've got a couple of blokes who are not too bad at it, isn't it? That, that's going to be a bit of an issue. Um, look, we obviously have to bat. We have to get more out of our top order as well, Marty. That, that's been obviously that was a key in um, in Tauranga. You know, when you when you look at Latham, uh, Williamson, Nichols, uh, what they offered just wasn't enough from from a Test match point of view. So they have to find a way. Kane has to um, you know has to find a way to get get some runs again. Nichols has got to be on his last legs. I mean, I know this New Zealand side of you know they've been very loyal to a lot of players for a long period of time, but. Um, Boy, he's uh, you know he's had a really lean run of it now for quite some time, so uh, he he needs to find some runs at Wellington. Um, you know if he's going to keep his Test career alive, I would think as well. Okay, so the way we bowled though, and the fields that we set, let's just go back to that quickly as well, because you weren't impressed with that in Tauranga. We we actually let them get well. Did we let them get really quick, easy runs, or are they just that good that they're going to do that with every bowling attack? They are good. Uh, don't get me wrong. They are good. They are positive. I understand that. We just can't afford to get hit both sides of the wicket. I, I think that's one of the keys. I don't mind having a couple of boundary riders. I'd like to set certain fields for certain players and, and just say, look, we'll allow you to play offside only. We are not going to give you leg side runs. Or if we think they're a very strong offside player, you know, we can set a leg side field accordingly and we will not allow you to score offside runs. So shut down one side of the ground for the most part if you can but you know it, it is just good line and length test match bowling and and it's not easy i'm not for one moment suggesting it's easy when guys are continually coming at you but uh you know new zealand have to be a little bit better uh, at, at that and, and if they can do that you know they're they're a side that you could bowl out for 180 200 in, in reasonable bowling condition because they will give you those opportunities Finally, Dooley, thanks so much for your time as always, mate. Um, that was extraordinary watching Australia on day three against India. When they, when they had a 60-run lead, they had nine in the bag. And then, you know, after watching us fold eight for 28, I was like, I can't do this anymore. I switch over. And I actually expecting Australia to be dominating that, squaring this. And in a day, they just get absolutely skittled again. That was, and that was their one test, Marty. You, you kind of felt that that was their test to win, didn't you? It was watching it, I thought, Gee, they're in a great spot, line and bowl uh, beautifully. You thought they were they were going to get a decent first innings lead, and then Aksar Patel comes in and uh, along with Ashwin and, and and sort of gets India to parity, and then all of a sudden, 
within the blink of an eye from, what were they, 60 for one, you just get one, two, three, and then Jadeja just goes right through them, and, and it becomes a, a one not one-sided completely, but it be, just becomes another test match where India are looking like they're going to dominate. It was it was incredible. Some of the shots that Australia played were, um, dare I say it, re- reckless, ridiculous, um, over the top. Pat Cummins, you know, I mean, for, for a captain, an Australian captain to walk out their first ball, I know he's a bowling, a bowler who can batter, but but I mean that was a horrendous shot to play first ball. I I think that just signalled how he felt things had gone previously for the sort of half an hour, forty minutes before that. So I felt there was India, uh, sorry Australia's one test where they were in the game and possibly could have battered Australia, uh, battered um, India out of it but didn't do it. You, you kind of get the feeling now that it's, it's just got 4-0 written all over it. Finally, I just love the idea and the fact that we're talking about Test cricket. These matches are so compelling. Um, you've got two different series going on, two different parts. Well, but, you know, they are. These are the th- I don't know, as a cricket fan, mate, these are the things I remember. I, I, I don't remember who won the Big Bash. Oh, yes, I do. The Perth team won the Big Bash. But, you know, the, I mean, <laughs> focusing on this for three day, three or four days, It's this is what we love about it, isn't it? It's a science. It's a chess match. You've got to get with it and understand it, people, what they, what's going on here. It is great to watch. Look, I mean, and, and you know, credit to, to Ben Stokes and uh, Brendan McCullum. What they have done with that England side has made them so watchable. They are the most watchable test match side in the world at the moment. And, you know, and it's not, you know, and I'm never going to use that the, the term that the journalists use because I think it's no, absolutely rubbish. Don't. And I know it's Brendan rubbish. hates it. Yep. No, I never use it. It's rubbish. Brendan hates it. And, and I'll never use it. But it, it's, and it's not about a different sort of style of game. It is just about allowing players to fail. And that's what Brendan's always been massive on, is being allowed to fail. And if you are not afraid to fail, then you will have more success. And, and, and that's all he's talked talk to these guys about. And when you're not afraid to fail, you actually express yourself a little bit more. And so therefore you become a, a more exciting side to watch. And that's exactly what they've done. And then you go to India and you look at, you know, you, you, you sort of, you're so intrigued before day one on what sort of a surface, what sort of pitch are India going to produce? Is it going to be like the first test match? Is it going to be sort of look like a shaved L shape on one side so that the left handers are going to get in trouble? Is it going to be decent in the middle so the seamers sort of can be played easily enough? So there's this intrigue around it at the moment. And I, 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 for one, am loving it. Absolutely loving it. I do all these T20 tournaments around the world. Sadly, don't get to do as much Test match cricket as I'd, as I'd like nowadays. But, um, you know, when I do, I, I absolutely love it and, uh, and I enjoy watching it as well.